Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, okay, I'm basically from the data science division, uh, which is uh, the reason why we are here now. Uh, the project I've worked with uh, since I joined about a year and a half ago uh, has been on text analytics and recently on data anonymization. Uh, basically, we are trying to build some engineer some data anonymization software to encourage data sharing. So the tools of my trade, Python, Spark, R, and beginning Scala, still very beginner, so that's all about me. If you are interested, you can just go to my LinkedIn page. <laughs> so uh, the contents, uh, just outline. Uh. So the problem with text analytics, what we are doing within government is that because we get a lot of feedback uh, from citizens uh, uh, across a lot of agencies, any feedback, e feedback channels that you have, there will be a lot of emails. Uh. Naturally, citizens, whenever they have problems, they will kind of complain. Uh. So how do we make sense of this uh, polymerous email other than looking through them individually? And that's the whole premise of why we pursue. Okay. So that's the reason why we uh, pursue this project uh, to explore what we can do with citizen feedback uh, across the government. And I basically just went through this. So there's a lot of text data around and we want to see whether we can use it to analyze and see sentiment on the ground, analyze is there any problem with our reports and what actions we can take to help overcome the problems that, that citizens are facing. So the case study I've been working on, I've been going through with through this presentation is we'll be focusing on text analytics on emails and uh, particularly on emails from the HDB sales channel. Uh, if you all have gone through some there are some first articles that have been published, so uh, just from Gulf Insider as well as in Tech Major, you all can go through their websites to have, a, have some information. Uh. So basically, uh, for benefit of uh, non-Singaporeans audience we have in the audience, HDB is basically uh, the Housing Development Board, which is um, the agency that builds public housing for Singaporeans. Uh. And the data that I analyzed came from the sales, HDB sales, which means those uh, from the BTO uh, that Singapore citizens and PR can apply to for public housing. And uh, HDB came to us and asked us whether we can use their, their emails to find out what's the primary issues that um, applicants are sending their emails to the chat to their to their channel. So what the data that I received from HDB was uh, raw emails from their CRM system. Um, if you all have worked with emails before, you will be familiar with some of the problems that we face with emails, and I'll go through uh, them later. Other than that, we also, they also sent to us some uh, accompanying basic center demographics as well as the internal organization. This was useful for us to do some um, uh, drill down after we have the, after we've done the analysis. And the emails that they sent to us was 200, over 270,000 in three and a half years from 2012 to first half of 2015. And in fact, uh, most of the emails were obviously sent in recent years. Uh, I think from 20, 2014 onwards, there was almost about 100,000 emails per year to their, to their sales channel. So the obvious problem is that um, there's a lot of emails you can't possibly expect people to be looking through them. So they came to us to see whether there's a more automated solution. Um, so now I'll go through the analysis methods. I think um, for those of us familiar with NLP, the obvious approach to discover topics within emails is topic modeling. And it's a very standard approach um, 
for this kind of problem. So let me go through what topic modeling is about. It's actually an uh, unsupervised uh, topic discovery processor. And it works by looking at work co-occurrence and the hypothesis is that words that are related to the same topic uh, tend to happen together. And with the discovery of topics, then you can assign the topics to the document based on the occurrence of the words within the document itself. So this process is completely uh, data-driven, so it does not depend on human input. And the benefit of this is that one is unbiased, it does not depend on what I know or what um, the officers know. So it's also able, at the same time, it's also able to review unknown topics, which is um, what we want to find out, whether there's anything that is happening that should be acted on, but it's not really um, known at the moment. Uh. Um, this slide is just a bunch of jargons. Uh, basically, topic modeling um, is a Bayesian model that has some latent class, and the latent class means that there are some hidden variables within, um, within the within the word gener topic generation process. And these hidden classes, okay, sorry, these hidden variables are the um, topic distribution within documents as well as the word distribution within topics. Uh. And it goes through some expectation, maximization process to, um, to discover all these things. And, but you don't really have to know, understand what's hidden, what's happening underneath because they are quite implemented algorithms uh, available within R, Python, Spark that can that can really be used uh, for this kind of analysis. Uh. So the bottom output uh, for each document, you get distribution across topics. Uh, so it's uh, n by k, which is the n will be the number of documents, and k will be the number of topics that you set. And then additionally, there's another output, which is the topic level word distribution which is um, the probability distribution of the words across each topic. So um, the dimension is k by v, and v will be the size of the vocabulary. Uh, yeah. So the steps to do the topic modeling, I'll just briefly go through, and these are some of the tools that you can use to do the steps on the left. Uh, basically, you load the text of the file, Obviously, uh, in Python, will be with V uh, as well as CSV CS for pandas. And then you do some text reading, text view processing. And most of the time, what you'll be using is the uh, regular expression package, uh, which is V. So you're just doing substitution to do some reading. Then after you're done reading on the text, uh, you split the text into tokens. What I mean by tokens is um, you can think of it as, as picking up the words. Uh. So if a, an email will be a huge chunk of a huge chunk of strings, uh, and you want to break it down into tokens before you can proceed to the next step, which is to create a documented matrix and um, to briefly give you an idea, a documented, a documented matrix is just a matrix where every row will be a document. So if you have n documents, it will be n rows. And then the columns will be the word count of all the words in your vocabulary. Each, each column will be an individual word. So you can see the document matrix is actually a very, very large matrix. Uh, but in essence, it's just trying to condense documents into uh, easily represented form. And you can also... Uh, see from this is that the document is going through this step. Um, it loses a lot of information within documents, especially with, with regards to the order of the words that appears in the document. But you discover that actually um, the order of words doesn't really matter in terms of the topics that are being discussed, because as long as the words occur together within a document, they, are, they, are, they appear um, in the cohesive manner, as in once one word appears, the other word will be the same topics will tend to appear together. So after you create a matrix, 
you remove stop words because stop words are very common and they usually don't mean a lot of things out. What I mean by stop words, uh, very common words are the, uh, he, she, all these are uh, what we call stop words. And then also, I, in addition, I treat vocabulary, which means I remove the vocabulary, they are, they are rare. And after that, I think to the LDA model, uh, which is the standard topic model that is uh, used usually. Uh. So on the right side, you can see this uh, process used with the JNC uh, topic model module. It's just one of the many. So you create a dictionary, then treat the vocabulary, create a document matrix, and then after that, you run the LDA with the LDA model. And then this is these are the steps uh, you use if you are using cycle level. Uh, it looks simpler, but actually there's a lot of complexity hidden inside the model process. Right? So the, the LDA model steps. Um, there are a lot of parameters that you need to control, and how you do that, you need to be familiar with what's being done. And so just look, what I did was just looking at online reference. To learn out. Um, yeah. So because I have a step background, I actually don't have any knowledge of, of text analytics. Uh, I just it's just something you have to pick up on the job. I don't think there's any formal educational training to learn this. Uh. So the problem phase. Uh, there are two main problems that I face uh, with with the earlier steps. I mean, this very straightforward, but. One of the biggest problems is text processing, uh, and those of us in the field knows are very familiar with this problem, which is data cleaning forms 80% of your work. Uh, and uh, I will go through briefly what are the steps I need to do, go through uh, what, what's the problem with the text, and what are the steps that I, I went through to clean them up. The other problem is with, with modern, sorry, modern interpretation. Uh, I'll go through them which later. So the first problem with text is that the, the emails, right, because they came raw from the CRM system, um, it contains a lot of structure within the emails. Uh, for example, the header, the footer, the signature text. Um, and this structure is not consistent. Uh, so you have people sending from Yahoo, from Gmail, uh, from Microsoft Exchange. Uh, so it's not, it's not easy to pass the emails. Uh, there's, no, there's no obvious tool out there that can handle this job robustly. Uh. But at the same time, most of this structure is not relevant for the analysis, uh, so I have to remove them in order for my model to do the analysis properly. Uh, and this is just an illustration of what you see. So an email, uh, a blurred email looks like this. You can see there's a lot of um, structure around, footer, header. And if you look at this, this whole email is so long, but the body, which is just a blue bar, right? I highlight, I highlight there. It's just, I don't know, 10% of, of the length of this email. The footer, the signature, everything makes up a, a hell of length on the email, but they're not relevant for the analysis. So you need to clean all this away in a um, automated manner. I mean, semi-automated uh, across over 100,000 emails uh, need a, a solution. Uh, and one of the obvious solution, I mean, you can look at the emails and have a, something that stands up very obviously is there are all these headers and footers, they contain very special regular patterns. Uh. They start with to, start with from, or if the signature starts from uh, visit our website and, and all this. So the obvious approach is to split the emails into lines and then try to remove all these with regular expressions. Uh. So basically I do a split by, by um, new lines and then I have a bunch of projects um, start with start with two, start with from, actually it's a huge, huge uh, bunch of projects that I, I thought of as I look through the email, uh, and that's, uh, that's the problem with this approach. Uh, I need to go through the emails to recognize the patterns, and then 
persuade them to reject, to feed into, to, to do the filtering. Yeah. But the benefit of this approach is that it's very precise. Uh, you can know exactly what, what patterns to search and you will remove the lines exactly. Uh. So, um, other than footer and header, right, the, the biggest problem is that the signature, the text and signature, uh, where people always write their name, their job title, all this, they do not contain um, special regular patterns uh, that uh, that I can use in the objects to clean off uh, because names I cannot use the objects to remove names because uh, names can also appear in the body. Uh, so if I use the objects, I remove everything that contains names of the officers. Then um, you may accidentally clean off significant chunk of the body. So uh, how I can, how I came this was I recognized that actually. Signature texts are usually quite short. So if you look at um, the chart to the right side, right, I think it's a bit small. So this, what happens after I see the lines, right? I counted um, the occurrence of the emails based on the length of the character length of each line, and I do a primitive um, proportion chart. So this, this actually is counting the number of characters, sorry, number of words per line, and this is the this is the number of um, words in line and the cumulative proportion. So for even for lines with at least two words, they actually form seventy-five percent of um, sorry for emails with less than two words, two or less words, they form seventy-five percent of of all the lines in the data. And for this one, it's the same chart on character length, uh, and you can see um, even an even line as short as 10 words, right, it forms already more than, I don't know, 93 percent of all the lines in the video. So um, you can recognize the length of lines are, uh, there, there are a lot of short lines, uh, and these short, short lines, my hypothesis is that they usually do not contain any meaningful content uh, because if the line is so short, they probably say thank you or they are probably part of the header even. And, and I use this as a filter to remove all those lines uh, and um, body with meaningful content usually are much longer than eight words or 40 characters. And I use those as a filter for my second filter. And then lastly, uh, this is the last step that I did, was that I recognized that um, there are some texts within the signature and the footer that are repeated frequently among the emails. Uh, for example, the, the disclaimer text. There is no text that says, oh, this email is private and confidential. If you're not intended recipient, you should delete the email immediately and all this. Uh, they're repeated very frequently. Uh. On the other hand, Meaningful email contents are unlikely to be repeated exactly. So emails that people actually type, they seldom get repeated exactly unless they are part of a conversation and this conversation is repeated, duplicated a few times within the data. So with this in mind, uh, I did a count of all the lines of emails uh, to, and then I filter away those, those lines they appear very often within the whole data. And um, just some plots that I, I did. So just to go through the steps, I counter the lines uh, within the emails using a counter, and then after that, I counter the counts to get this plot. Uh. And this is just saying that, OK, emails will be 50 counts. So lines will be counts, and you can read that for 10 times. And then you can see that lines that appear exactly once in the email, right? Like, in the data actually happen. And these kind of lines, they actually, there are almost a million of them. Uh. So these are where the meaningful content are usually decided. And those that are repeated very often are uh, most of the time changer tags or standardized replies. And I uh, use this to find a cut off to remove. Like, say, lines are repeated more than 100 times. 
So that's all I use to fill out the text. And next is the, the upwards. Uh, as I showed just now, the upper from the top model, there are actually two recommended matrix. Uh, and it's very hard to interpret them without, uh, without tools that you can use to visualize. Uh. And this is compiled because uh, the topics in the Topics that are output from the model, they need to be labeled for the subsequent analysis to be useful. And the topic labeling has to be done by the officers of the ground. I'm not familiar with the issues that are faced by HDB. So it's better for those HDB officers that are handling facing the emails regularly to be doing the labeling. So I need to be able to hand over the, the output to them in the way that it can be interpreted, you cannot just hand them these two matrix. Now, nah, you all go and see what you all can do with this. It's not going to work out. So what I did was, um, was to do a visualization. This is, uh, I didn't do this visualization from scratch. Uh, this is an uh, open source module. It's called Pi LDA based. Uh, what it does, actually, is it's just visualizing, visualizing the topics in a 2D kind of so these are the five topics, uh, and then the size of the bubble represents the size of the topic within the corpus. And I can write the words um, for each topic on the right, uh, and these are ranked um, I don't know. So let me just quickly show this. Is. Can you just give, me, give you a look of how the output look like? So something like this. Uh, you can clearly see, okay, for this topic, what are the, what are the words? And there are some slides here to, for you to organize the order of the words um, in different manner. So I, I handed this to the HDB officers and they went through every topic and tried to slide it around to see what words are set up for the topic to, to represent the topic and then they label the topics from there. Uh, and then they came back to me with the topics and then from there I went on to do further analysis. Okay. Let me continue. So some of the topics that, that appear um, two sides, these are, these are the chunk topics. Uh, but you can actually see the topic on that, especially um, what do you think this kind of text comes from? Confidential, uh, privilege, um, schools, disseminate, media. I mean, it's obvious it came from some form of disclosure text uh, where people usually type all this email is private and confidential, if you're not intended on you see here, please delete it immediately. Do not disseminate. So you can see how the keywords are there. So one thing I want to point with topic model is that actually topic model can also at the same time help you in the data cleaning process because they actually group all these um, highly coherent words that appear together together in the same topic. And this usually appear in a similar text so they get put together and form one topic instead of being spread around within other topics. So the analysis outcome after I've done the later topics uh, is what was what came out. Okay, some of the main topics are rejected uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but you can see there are, there are a cluster of four topics on the left that are related to the key collection. There are some um, variety requests, some people obviously uh, we will need to ask for waiver of housing policy that, that is affecting them or they're discussing about flat furnishing of the new flats. So what I said now was there are a number of topics we do the collection. Uh, and when we put them together and we plot them out um, across the proportion of the emails that we see, you can see that actually more than 25% of the emails 
Glory to the King. Glory to the King. And we started the here in my life. Today, we will start with emails appealing for priority education um, was, was a major part of the emails that they received from. But they didn't realize that the emails discussing, requesting for key correction scheduling, number delay, correction, and, and asking for key correction are taking a lot of time. So, what this should be really focusing on should be songs that require their attention, which is quality allocation and waiver of, of their policies. Uh, this is where you need the human input. For something as simple as security creation schedule, it should be something that can be automated easily um, with a website or something. So, um, yeah, so they, they actually need something which I'll go through later. Okay, another interesting thing, but it's not really act on, act on is, was something like this. Uh, we, we found that actually the reason why people request for early key correction or later key correction was kind of related to the yeah. age. Uh. So the two roles at the top actually are uh, email requests for delay key correction, and the two roles at the bottom are for requesting early key correction. And then the columns are within the age group. Uh. So the, the proportion are normalized according to, on the row. And you can see that for requests uh, on different key correction, right, there are actually high proportion of people who are older. And on the other hand, uh, requests for early key correction, there are more requests from younger people. Um, we went remember to them and they, they think that this was interesting, but uh, they have a reason, they, they, they propose a reason why the, the case is because older people, usually they have a flat, um, they just still try to dispose of. So that's why they refer to question, because if you, you must have sold off your, if you have received a flat, you must sell your previous flat, I think you get some time frame, and if they have not done so, then they do not want to the keys out. On the other hand, younger people, obviously, their first home, they're very excited. So they want their keys earlier to, to get their flat out. Or maybe they want to get away earlier. So. so what came out from this project was, um, because of the large amount of requests to, uh, for adjusting key correction, HGB actually facilitated efforts to um, to treat this facility in the key correction schedule. Uh, I think they are trying to set up a website for people to do a self-service uh, to adjust the key correction schedule. And uh, the next point was that um, this project gave them a data, a quantifiable and data supported overview of the thousands of emails that they received from the public. And this is useful because especially for management, because they do not look at the emails that the officers are looking at, and the officers can, are only able to communicate um, what they see individually to, to the management. Of. But with this, the management will be able to see clearly what is the distribution of the request um, from the public, and it gives them a better, better idea of what is happening at the, at the lower level. They also have the officers have some sense check on uh, what's the major and, and minor issues uh, that they are that's faced by the HGB customers. Uh. So, in conclusion, um, topic modeling is one of the, I would say it's one of the low hanging fruit uh, for financial language processing. Actually, it is surprisingly useful despite its simplicity. Uh, I mean, look at the steps, you're not doing something really complex. Just counting the words and then transform them into matrix, and then you put inside the algorithm, and then it spits out the output and you look at it. Uh. So it doesn't use okay, it does use some form of machine learning, but it's not deep learning or doing some language passing that is more common in uh, most NLP projects. Uh. However, with such simple tool, it was able to produce a high impact. Especially with my project. Uh, as a result, we are planning to scale this up 
into a self help, self service tool for government agencies. Uh, we are still in the process of building this tool, and we hope that in the future, uh, more agencies can benefit from this kind of analysis. So um, that's all I have for my sharing. Do you all have any questions? So many. Yeah, so I uh, was wondering for um, conversational threats. So, like emails you will see, you know, reply, reply, and then uh, have you deal with that at all? If not, in my like, overall sample, because we'll see, you know, repetitions. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I didn't deal with it, uh, to be honest. Uh, it's very hard to pass conversation because, as I mentioned earlier, the structure is very inconsistent. So, I included all the conversation and the repetitions into the model. Uh, Actually, in some sense, it is useful for email replies. Uh. You have sometimes email replies, you say yes, thank you, and then there's no, you don't get any context of what was the, what was the conversation about, and, and the, the, the conversation at the bottom kind of help in labeling the topic in a more accurate manner. Although I agree that it's repeated, but uh, it did not, I mean, it was a tolerable, uh, I would say. Yeah. Uh. yeah. Hi. Uh, so I just have to ask you two questions. Uh, firstly, MD is the unsupervised method. So how do you actually validate your results? Like, I want to just know how you actually choose the number of groups that you chose there. Because there's no way to know that there's the right number of groups. And secondly, is there a reason you use LDA instead of other methods like um, talk to web or something which probably might work? Thanks. Uh, regarding the number of topics and how do you know which what is best? This is there's no like, like I said there's no hard and fast rule. So I mean, what I did was I threw in a lot. Uh, I threw a number of topics from 10 to 35 and then I fitted out of them. And how did, how did I set up 25 was using the visualization tool. So looking at the visualization, um, if you look at this, you can see the topics are spread around uh, across the, the two dimensions that, that are plotted here. And I use that as a, as a sense check that, to say that these topics are distinct and hopefully they, they are more meaningful. Uh, if the topics are all covered in the center with one outlier, it means that there's one very distinct topic and everything else is very similar. And using this, I, I, after I do a monitoring, I, I see 25 topics seems to look the best. Uh. So it's just based on fewer. <laughs> there's, no, there's, no, there's no hard rule. Uh. Yeah, so that, that was my approach. Uh. And as, a, as to why I use LDA instead of talk to VEC, um, it's just based on what was. More what, was, what was the more approachable tool for me? I'm not familiar with talk to back at the moment. So, um, LDA was easy to use. There were a lot of reference for me to uh, look at and see how the models can be picked up, how can they be adjusted, how can they be interpreted. So, that's why it's up to be seen there. Hi. Hello. Thanks for sharing. Um, my question is, how do you ensure that the data science you do is not discriminatory? And I guess my point is, you know, in the Paris sector, data science is usually used for optimizing products, right? Um, so it's okay to decide on the of the audience, but since this is government, there are serious implications of, as to how government is responding to the citizens. So for example, something I mentioned, like cutting out the shorter email lines, you know, there's a worry that that might you know, disproportionately cut out the emails from people who are less fluent in English, right, who, who write shorter sentences. So how do you, I mean, it's not like me, but if that is true, it can have very serious implication. How do you count against that? I think at the end of the day, the outputs, the, the, the analysis you do, is not a machine-to-machine -machine conversation. It comes to a human. Uh, I have to do a presentation to HDB, and then after that, they take action from there. So there's always going to be human input in between analysis to 
have a sense check whether this is something that's affected, whether um, uh, it is reasonable to act on. So, in some sense, we hope that the human input will help us um, handle this issue. Yeah. So we also have a lot of analysts to do a sense check. I just want to add a clarification to, to that as well. Uh, all the emails hit, uh, that ACP receives are, are responded to by individual officers, unless it's total garbage, of course, that would be on the What What the focus of here, the focus of this project was, was really to improve the overall experience. The emails, you know, they're still being responded to, but now this is an opportunity to cut down 25% of those emails, so you don't have to talk to anyone to share your key collection data. So, uh, no one misses out here. In this particular instance, shouldn't worry about that. Hi, uh, thanks for sharing. I was wondering, one question, do you consider using PAIDS to remove all the crappy words or as a piece to keep your turn around today? And second, what was the outcome of this as an impact? How does HDB use your finding to make life better? Okay, so regarding DFIDF, DFIDF, what DFIDF does is just doing a relating of, of words that occurs across um, the, the frequency of words that occurs across documents. Uh, and this was partially handled when I do a document, sorry, vocabulary training. I train by the frequency as well as the document frequency of the vocabulary. Those that are two you know, care too much or too little, uh, they are treated away on both sides. Uh. So in kind, in kind of, uh, it's similar to what TFIDF is doing. Why they use TFIDF in the, in the current term that feed inside LDA is because the assumption of LDA is it's on, it's trying to model the counter. So if I do TFIDF relating, then it's actually, um, to break the assumption of, of LDA, that's why I do not use, I do use TFIDF. I actually, I tried doing that, and uh, um, in, in subsequent projects, I tried doing that, and the result came out kind of garbage uh, because uh, rare words that occur have high count, appear uh, to have high count, high count in the LDA, and then they turn out to be hugely related to the topics that came out, so they didn't make sense. Uh, and, um, so I was the second question. How is HDB used your insight to improve life? So how has HDB used my insights? Um, I think the, the impact of this analysis was in terms of resource management. Uh, so if HDB were to implement the process to automate, um, sorry, to implement some self-help service for applicants to adjust their key correction schedule, then HDB officers will not have to be manually replying to these emails and arranging their schedule for them. So instead of doing this, they are doing um, tasks that are require more human input, such as doing appeals, doing requests, um, operating housing policies and all this. And this is the, the, the tasks that are more valuable to them that they can focus on. Um, maybe one last question. Okay. Um. I think just now you mentioned that uh, there are some supplementary CRM bits for this recognition of Do you think you can share what those methods are like and how do you incorporate them into your analysis? Thanks. Um, the CRM information mainly is um, on which officer acted on these emails, as well as the, what is the classification the officer gave to the email, and uh, means what is mainly labeled on the emails. So I did not look at which officer was one because that's not the point of the analysis. Regarding what was actually categorized, uh, on the analysis, if you look at it, as because of the categorization, um, the categories where I was actually came up with a while back. So a lot of the categories became outdated. So when I look at the categories, comparing with the, with the past category, right, there were more than 70% of them were classified as others. Uh, because obviously, um, one, because the categories are outdated, but secondly, because some of the emails, they have multiple labels, uh, so the officers do not know how to label them 
the result of labeling them as others. Uh. So how I use how I also used that was to compare my my discover topics with what was originally labeled and uh, it showed there's correlation with some of the labels, discover labels with what has been actually been labeled. Uh. That means um, top sorry emails they are mainly classified as um, priority allocation were actually in the topic for priority allocation that was discovered. So it kind of helped me verify that the topics I discovered were um, make sense. Uh. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's all I will share for, for regarding this topic. I hope uh, everybody uh, benefited from this to have a clear understanding what we are doing with the government because of data science. Thank you very much.